Hi, everyone. My name is Evan Ortlieb, and welcome to another edition of Education for Today. We're going to be looking at the habits of inclusive leadership. It's a topic that's incredibly important today and sometimes overlooked within the uh, scheme of education, organizations, and business in general. And I think the elephant in the room many times for those of us in leadership positions is, how can I address issues of diversity when I'm a white male or female? And what would I know about the challenges that others face from more marginalized cultures and backgrounds and their experiences? And I think further, we oftentimes think about the challenges that are associated with embracing diversity in the classrooms or schools or organizations, but we fail to tap into and fully understand the distinct advantages that diverse organizations have by having a diverse skill set, background knowledge, ways to relate to students and other individuals, and even a multifaceted appreciation for the arts and sciences, if you will. And so this presentation is really going to provide you with tangible takeaways to develop habits of inclusive leadership. Let's go ahead and get started. So first, I think it's incredibly important to define some of these terms that we hear all over the place, such as diversity, equity, and inclusion. So when we talk about diverse populations, we're talking about the presence of differences, and that could be race, gender, ethnicity, background, age, et cetera, et cetera. When we're talking about equity, we're trying to think about how do we promote justice, impartiality, and fairness within the procedures and policies and processes that are in place within our organization or classroom. And finally, inclusion is the outcome that's necessary to ensure that uh, those who are diverse actually feel uh, welcomed within our organizations, within our classrooms and our schools alike. And so I think the, one of the first things that we have to do here is to think about what are the root causes of most negative outcomes associated in these spaces. And I think it comes from the lack of realized education and appreciation for others. We know that one of the greatest challenges in life is a lack of access and realized opportunity within education. And that's no different if we think about what are the potential advantages of embracing diversity, equity, and inclusion within our spaces? This quote here, it says, small changes often facilitate the biggest impacts. And to be clear, there are critical systems level changes that are needed to really combat bias and discrimination within organizations. But oftentimes, leaders have the opportunity to be anti-racist and increasingly inclusive in their day-to-day -day interactions with others. And that's something to keep, um, something to help keep this work centered and sustained for the long haul is those day-to-day -day, uh, decisions and actions that you take. It's not necessarily those big initiatives and changes that happen on a year-to-year -year basis. It's the daily grind, if you will. Um, so think about that, that every act that you take towards um, embracing diversity, equity, inclusion in your organization is a step towards making bigger impacts. Inclusion has a real impact on everything from performance to retention. And oftentimes, organizations tend to concentrate their energy on hiring and sharing diverse data sets and so forth to say, here's how we've made ground on issues around diversity. Instead of really examining and going deep within thyself on the existing dynamics within your organization, within your division, your department, et cetera. And as a result, oftentimes the I, the inclusion part, is too oftentimes left out. It's ignored in relation to diversity and equity that we hear a little bit more about these days. And one quote here at the bottom of the page, it says, as humans, our brains are wired for bias. You can't just assume inclusion will sprout organically once you've introduced it, um, uh, once you've introduced this, this sort of topic. And so again, inclusion has a real impact on everything. And it's something that's really going to guide our discussion today. Just some simple stats here from a number of different studies. Uh, we know that, for instance, racially and ethnically diverse organizations are oftentimes uh, uh, actually perform better to a greater degree because they're able to actually work with one another beyond just uh, uh, mimicking and, and a replication of eight of the same perspectives. Secondly, diverse teams are 87% better at making decisions according to uh, a recent study that was published in People Management in a UK journal. This was a study of over 600 business uh, decisions that were made by 200 teams, and they found that 
diverse teams made business decisions uh, more often than not that were more successful than those who were not. Finally, inclusive companies are 1.7 times more innovative, which is interesting to think about as an educator because we know that we want classroom schools and even the partnerships that we create to, to, to sort of embrace innovation. And I think diversity is at the crux of accomplishing that. So a companies that are diverse and encourage inclusion aren't just more likely to outperform competitors, they're also almost twice as likely to be leaders of innovation. Involving others through intentional collisions is sort of going to guide the discussion on this page. And great leadership is really about catalyzing more effort, engagement, and productivity. And it's creating a formula where, as we've said before, one plus one can equal more than two. In many ways, this happens as a result of those typical small invisible acts of inclusion, where you give credit where credit is due, ask to hear other perspectives, and simply follow up by saying thank you to those who support the common mission. Inclusive leaders leave every person in every room better than when they found it. And that's something that not can be said for every leader and not every day in, in any of us, right? And so meaningful inclusion is about those everyday actions that make most of us, that, that most of us don't even recognize or, or notice. Um, one of those things that I, I thought would be important to kind of talk about is something called a micro exclusion. We hear a lot about microaggressions. I wanted to include micro exclusions here. It's where we humans default, where who do I trust in my group? Who are my go-to people? Who do I already have an existing relationship with? And who am I sitting next to? And those oftentimes are the people that we rely upon to a greater degree than everybody on our, uh, on our collective teams. Inclusion is really about bringing those others into the fold. It's about sourcing the thoughts and feelings and perspectives of others so that we can come up with solutions that benefit everyone. And it requires an intentional effort to really empower those people around you and give everyone equal access to decision-making and this sort of communities of growth and contribution within our organizations. And I think all of us certainly can gain um, some prowess in that area. We know that we too oftentimes rely upon those go-to people well, everyone can be a go-to person if we are actually successful in being inclusive leaders. So now we're going to talk about the four habits that are going to guide your operations and take you to the next level to be an inclusive leader. So the first thing is we want to be able to invite and display authenticity, right? So we need to be able to create deliberate spaces for conversation. We need to be able to check in uh, before we check on people. In other words, we need to make space for feelings and human connection before necessarily turning the conversation to work, which I am the, I will tell you first off, I'm one of the biggest offenders of that. It's really an opportunity to provide personalized support to be able to uh, uh, embrace someone as a person in order to later on uh, have them contribute to a greater extent and really just gain a, a critical teamwork perspective on that. We need to be able to show vulnerability, but set intentions and draw boundaries. So if, if a leader uh, such as myself, for instance, we need to be able to say when we messed up, when we made mistakes, what, what were we timid about? What were we scared to be able to do? Uh, and, and what do you know and what don't you know already? Because that's going to go a long way showing your, your humanistic side, your, your, your side that's prone to error at times. And as it says here on the page, we often hear these slogans in the workplace like come as you are or bring your whole self, but sometimes that's cliche. And it doesn't mean that we're trying to hire somebody wearing a wacky outfit or something like that. More con concretely, it's about the ability to give upward feedback. So those who are on your team or who look up to you as their supervisor, are you, are you welcoming their feedback you know, at any given time? Are you trying to uh, seek out what is it that they could need to, to further be able to do their jobs more successfully? Um, are they willing to admit mistakes and vice versa to be able to reveal more aspects about who you are and who they are, uh, even if it doesn't fit within the dominant culture within your organization. And I think that vulnerability sets you up for understanding people and then understanding where they come from in order to, again, invite and display authenticity. Second habit for inclusive leadership is building self-awareness and curiosity. 
Um, you need to be able to ask certain questions of your past, present, and future selves. For instance, when have I failed to show up for other people and be there as a source of support? Have I witnessed mistreatment and just let it go without defending a teammate or a colleague? When have I, what have I learned from my experiences that I could do better next time? Well, have I gotten tense in certain situations? And what am I focusing on right now that's going to improve um, my future self, if you will, down the road as a result? Those are some, some questions that can really help guide our self-reflections to become more aware and curious in our current positions. So uh, some other questions that you might want to think about here, what were you hoping uh, I'd speak to in that situation that I didn't? You might be able to ask that upon other people or what's important to you about that you know, concept or what have you, or what else uh, should we address in this meeting? That sort of thing. Um, when, when people are addressing these sorts of issues, it goes a long way to show that you don't just care about the outcome, but you care about the person itself. Um, so people spending a lot of time consuming information and so, so on and so forth, but you need to get to know the person first. Inclusive leadership habit number three, seek out and respond well to feedback. <clears throat> again, feedback, we hear that over and over again, not only in education, but in organizational success. And for that matter, in leadership, we need to be able to have feedback across the aisle from other leaders, from outsiders and other stakeholders, but also from our respective teams. So part of that has to do with start by focusing on the purpose and the intent. So folks might be misinterpreting the intention, intentionality um, of, of, of a task or an initiative that you really start off addressing. And part of that has to do with maybe they've been burned in the past or they've had turnover in terms of their organizational leadership and they haven't always perhaps been open to uh, uh, criticism or feedback or other sorts of input. And that's why it's really important to attach an intention statement such as to help me keep improving or I'm really trying to communicate more clearly about decision making. What could I do better? Um, what could be really helpful, if you will? So those are some of the things to think about in terms of intentionality and the overall purpose behind your messaging. Secondly, ask scaling questions. So like on a scale of one to 10, how, do you, how well do you think I facilitated that meeting? Most of the time you'll hear a seven or eight and so forth when people are uncomfortable sharing the truth. But that's why the second question is the magic. What would it take to increase that score by one point? Maybe you'll hear something like, you could have called on more people to include their other voices. Or um, maybe you could start by giving people uh, opportunity to express themselves in an asynchronous fashion before the meeting even starts. And so those are some of the things to think about for asking squaling, uh, scaling questions, if you will. <laughs> um, also, in, in, in the process of doing that, you're making micro steps in the right direction. We're going to talk about how do you level up your responses right after the following slide. So in order to uh, respond well to feedback, you need to be able to seek feedback in certain areas. And so within an organization, opportunities to do so would be What's the quality of the meeting that we just had? What are opportunities for growth from a conversation? What are other opportunities that more people can contribute to a common mission? Uh, developmental feedback quality or clarity of performance expectations, increased access to information or data to be able to make effective decisions. All these sorts of things, including feeling that one's perspective is heard and valued. These are areas where you can seek feedback you can gain that feedback and you can act upon that right away. And those are definitely uh, areas for all leaders to consider. And finally, on inclusive leadership habit number three, in terms of the key elements in responding well to feedback, these would include saying thank you, asking for examples, asking for the overall impact to people's perspectives, coming up with action plans, holding yourself and your team accountable, both privately and publicly, right? Oftentimes we are our bit of biggest critics and maybe that's a good thing at times. And finally, following up quickly to show that you've implemented that feedback and try to address it to really show that you value their opinions and their efforts made to go outside of their comfort zone oftentimes to provide that important feedback to you. Inclusive leadership habit number four is the fourth and last is lifting up other perspectives consistently. When I say manage the airways, <clears throat> this is where we're talking about 
It's not enough that just everyone has a seat at the table. Inclusive leaders make sure everyone gets airtime. And this means creating spaces in meetings or classrooms for every person to be able to say something. The extroverted folks and the people who have been there forever always dominate the identity of an overall group. They always get their perspectives heard and we all know who those people are on our teams, but leaders need to be able to pay attention to these dynamics um, and allow everyone to have a voice, everyone to be able to contribute in some way. It could be through back channels, it could be through asynchronous communication, it could be through uh, private conversations if somebody doesn't wanna speak up within that meeting construct, um, but everyone should have the opportunity to do that. It shouldn't be required, but the opportunity should be there. Um, and then that would allow more introverted folks or other people who are not necessarily comfortable in that situation to participate in their own self-selected way. Uh, other ones are, are, as any teacher knows, provide additional think time, but also ritual questions like, who haven't we heard from yet? Uh, would be an important thing to, to be able to consider for managing the airways. And finally, tackling situations, not conflicts, not problems, not challenges, but situations head on. So for instance, when situations arise and they inevitably will, you need to consider your options. You could talk to the person who might've been impacted and say, you know, <clears throat> hey, um, would you like me to say something? Or how did that make you feel? Or what might we do next time uh, differently that would be more beneficial or, or idealistic for you? You could also pull aside the individual who caused a disturbance or set up the situation and say, can we talk about that comment that you made? I noticed when you said X, Y, Z, the other person didn't engage as much afterwards. And so I've been there, I've said that sort of stuff before, but would you be up for discussing that a little bit further? Again, address these situations head on and make your life easier in the future. So finally, to summarize habits of inclusive leadership, we need to be able to make goals and track that progress. The bottom line, is that you need to make a plan for how you're going to show up as a more inclusive leader every single day. Otherwise, you won't make that progress that you seek. As is often said in the world of diversity, equity, and inclusion, if we don't intentionally include, then we're unintentionally excluding. So we simply cannot afford to keep doing that. I hope that this um, presentation has been beneficial to you. Please consider liking the video, subscribing to the channel, and stay tuned for all things education for today. Take care.